Now we're moving back to clustering. So we're interested in overall characteristics of the pattern as such. And as I mentioned in the introduction, under spatial randomness, we can derive, because we have this homogeneous Poisson distribution, we can derive regularities about how far these events could be from each other. Because whether you focus on how many events there are in a particular area, or you look at how far these events are from each other, it's just two sides of the same coin. Um, I may have mentioned this in an earlier lecture, but the, in a time series context, you can think of um, how many light bulbs blow per month, which is like a quadrat count. You take the month and you count how many light bulbs blow out. Or you can measure the time from one light bulb blowing up to the next one blowing up. These are just two ways of looking at the same process, and they're connected to each other. So this is nothing but extending this in two dimensions, and instead of counting how many events in a particular area, we will focus on the distances between the events. And then there's two ways of doing this, just like in a time series too. We can look at the distances between the events themselves. It's very confusing because they're all points. They're all called points, but they're not. Uh, in the terminology, there's a distinction between events and points. But geometrically and on the map, they're all points. So it's very confusing. The way to keep them separate is think of an event as really the thing you're interested in. So the event is the location of the homicides or the location of the people, the addresses of the people with the disease. Points are just reference points. And just like in the scan statistics, you get this grid over the data and you draw the circles centered on grid points. These are the points that we talk about here. So we'll do two things. We'll measure the distances between two events, or we'll measure the distance from one of our reference points to the nearest or a number of events. So one is called event to event distance, the other one is called point-to-event distance. So there's really, as we see, we'll see later, that they're, they're all, in the end, equivalent, because they all relate back to these regularities that we have under complete spatial randomness, which is a homogeneous Poisson distribution, which gives us exactly how many points we can get in a particular area. And the way we make the connection between these two <coughs> is to make our area circles. So if our areas are circles, then we know how many points are in the circle, but we also know if there are no points in the circle, how far two points might be from each other. And that's how you connect it to, how you connect the distribution, which is the Poisson distribution, which is really about how many points, how many events, sorry, how many events in a circle of a given radius. But if you think of it, and you have an event, and you draw a circle that is as large as possible before it touches another one, then you can connect that distance, which is the radius of that circle, to the probabilities that Poisson gives you for having no events in this circle beyond the one in the center. Because it's all purely mathematically spelled out, and that's the connection between the two. So if we know that we have a completely random process with complete spatial randomness, then we can also say something about the distances between two events. And typically, these are the nearest neighbor distances. So the distance between an event and its nearest neighbor. And there, or alternatively, we take a reference grid, and we take the distance from any point on the reference grid to the nearest event the nearest homicide location, for example. And there are literally hundreds of these kinds of statistics because in the early literature, there was uh, a lot of um, interest in this in the mathematical properties of these. And for example, the largest nearest neighbor distance or the smallest nearest neighbor distance or the average nearest neighbor distance and so on. All these things could be related 
to what they would be under complete spatial randomness. Because under spe complete spatial randomness, you have properties, specific properties for the distances between points. And we'll get to that in, in a minute. So then, the, I won't say the point, but the idea behind these statistics is that you construct some kind of summary of the data. Say, you take, take the, nearest, the nearest neighbor distance between two events and you take the smallest one. And then you compute what is the probability of that distance occurring under complete spatial randomness. And if that's too small, then you reject the null. Okay. Or you can take the average or the maximum or whatever. And so there are literally hundreds of these. You know, in Cressy's textbook, remember the, the statistics for spatial data, he has a table and, and it's like a page and a half long or a page long with all these different nearest neighbor statistics. They're basically not really used anymore. Uh, point pattern analysis has moved beyond this and um, uses so-called refined nearest neighbor statistics. And the G function, not to be confused with the G statistic, which we'll see later, is um, one of these refined ne nearest neighbor statistics. And um, basically, the G function and the F function are the same idea. One deals with event to event distances. The other one deals with point to event distances. But they're the same idea. What you do is you build a cumulative distribution function for these distances. So we don't take the smallest one or the largest one or the average one, we take them all. Okay. So for every event, take an event, find the closest event, find the distance to that closest event. That goes into our hopper. The next event, find the closest event, the distance to that event. We take all of these and make a cumulative distribution function. Why do we do that? Because under complete spatial randomness, because of this Poisson distribution, we know exactly what that cumulative distribution function should be. And so for every distance, we can draw the proportion, the fraction of the nearest neighbor's distances that would be smaller than or equal to that given distance. And that is the formal expression of the G function for every given distance, d, we get the number of, there's other ways of writing this, and in the, in the summary I've written it a little more formally with an indicator function, but basically you count the number of i's, i's are events, for which the nearest neighbor, the distance to the nearest event is less than our d. Now we pick the d, okay? So we say one mile, two miles, three miles, four miles, and so on. We count the number of times this fits, and we take the fraction of n. n is the total number of events. So if we take one mile, we have 100 points. Five of these nearest neighbor distances are less than one mile. That is 5 over 100. Okay, And just like a cumulative distribution function, as your distance gets bigger and bigger, eventually all the nearest neighbor distances will be less than that reference distance. Okay? If the city of Buffalo, I don't know how big it is, but I'm sure if I go up to 500 miles, all of them will be in there, so that fraction at that point will be effectively one. Okay? So we increase up until we reach one, just like with any cumulative distribution function. And so we plot this it's like a histogram. You have to pick the cut points, pick the distances, and then just compute the fractions, and then plot them. And you plot these fact fractions against the distances. That's your g function. Now, edge correction. Nearest neighbor distances, you don't know what's outside the bounding box, so you don't know whether your nearest neighbor is really the one that you get inside the bounding box, or there may be one outside the bounding box that you don't see. So there are a number of different ways, I won't dwell on this, um, in which you can do edge corrections. Um, the simplest way is this buffer ID. So you take the, um, 
I think the smallest of the nearest neighbor distances, and that becomes your buffer. And then you, you do all the analysis for the points on the inside of the buffer, assuming that your nearest neighbor will be in the buffer if it's not inside. Another method is to simply replicate the pattern on the outside. And so it's, think of a square, and you kind of bend it so that the sides of the square touch each other. And so then the neighbors on the left of the square are actually points on the right of the square. And the neighbors on the top of the square are points on the bottom of the square. So you bend it over and artificially creates neighbors on the other side, so to speak, which is assuming that the pattern just replicates itself around the, the center square. And then there's other methods that are a little more mathematical in form that are similar adjustments where you try to basically guess the, the chances that your nearest neighbor is not inside the box but outside the box and correct for that. And it does make a difference but not a big difference. So this is another picture of the Cardiff point data in SPATSTAT. So we want to construct from this the cumulative distribution function of the nearest neighbor distances. For every one of these points, we take the nearest neighbor and that distance. Next one, nearest neighbor and that distance, and so on. And then we plot these, the proportion of these against the cutoff. So let's say we have a number of different cutoff points. I just took the defaults and spat that. You can manipulate this, but before you do that, you should know what, really know what you're doing. But basically, this is good enough. And it shows you the difference between this cumulative distribution function, see eventually it goes to 1, with a border correction and without. And see here, the difference is the biggest. At, at these larger distances, there are more edge effects. Why? because there's more chance that you're outside. If your distance, the larger your distance, your nearest neighbor distance gets, the more chance you have, just think of drawing a circle, that the circle will be outside the bounding box. So the, the, near, the edge corrections are really most visible in practice at these larger distances. Typically, if you're going to do anything, do at least a buffer. Uh, that's, uh, that's a good you know, run of the mill correction. It's not too complicated. The other ones, you know, they all have pros and cons. Uh, typically in this business, the more contrived and sophisticated your corrections are, the more you're likely to create problems with your corrections that you might not have had with the original data. So um, keep it simple, but this is just to illustrate that there is a difference between the two. And so this, as such, doesn't really help us. But this is just a cumulative distribution function of nearest neighbor's distances. Yeah. So what? So, so what comes when we can figure out what this distribution would be under complete spatial randomness? So what is the distribution, the cumulative distribution function of the nearest neighbor distances, of the distances from an event to the nearest event? And this is where our circles come in. We have an event, and let's say we have a distance d that becomes the radius of a circle around that event. What is the probability that we have no points in that circle? We've actually already done that. We did this in the last lecture. This follows a Poisson distribution with intensity lambda, which is the, the intensity, obviously we don't know it, but we know it's constant, and the area. And the area is pi d squared. So the probability in the Poisson distribution, we did this the other day, that there are no points in that area is this negative exponential. So then the probability that there is a point in that area is the complement of this, 1 minus this negative exponential. So for every distance, we can draw this. We just plug in the d. You see it's d squared, so, and, and it's an exponential, so it's a nonlinear function. So for different d's, we'll have a nonlinear function, and then we can compare our estimated, if you wish, 
uh, cumulative distribution function to this theoretical distribution function. That's the idea. That's how we go from our Poisson distribution that deals with events and areas to something that is a cumulative distribution for distances between events. Okay. Now we're a little further. Now we see that this theoretical spatial randomness is very different from what we observe. How very different? We're still nowhere. We don't know, just like in any statistical test, we don't know whether this is far or not far. We think it's far, and our intuition tells us it is, but it's not necessarily so. What we need to know is what is the randomness that we can expect? This is a pure theoretical cumulative distribution. If we have actually spatially random point patterns, what is the randomness that we might get in an estimated G function? This is not estimated. This is a theoretical distribution. It's like you writing down the equation for a normal distribution and drawing a nice bell-shaped curve. Your actual points may be, or your data may be, randomly dis uh, normally distributed, they're not going to follow this nice bell shape. They'll stick out a bit, be a little bit under. It's that kind of randomness that we need to get a sense for. How are we going to do this? Always the same thing. We're going to take our points, 168 points I believe, randomly put them on our bonding box. In other words, replicate a completely spatially random point pattern and estimate for that point pattern what the empirical cumulative distribution is. And we'll do this multiple times. So we'll use a randomization approach. Um, analytical results are typically intractable. There are some, but they rely on fairly unrealistic assumptions in terms of edge effects and things like that. So we'll mimic complete spatial randomness. We know how to do this. We, we've already done it in class and, and in the lab, I believe. So you take this fixed number of points and you uniformly spread them through the box. This gives you the points. And then you compute an estimated cumulative distribution function. And then you draw it. And you draw a whole bunch of these. And from that, you construct what we call a simulation envelope. This gives you a sense of the range of uncertainty associated with these estimated cumulative uh, distribution functions. And there are a number of different ways in which you can do this. One is that you take just the maximum and the minimum <coughs> for each distance d, and I'll show you in a second. The other one is a little more subtle in that you don't take the absolute minimum and the absolute maximum, but you do a percentile. So you take the one at the 5 percentile and the one at the 95 percentile, and that then becomes your end. But let me show you how you do this. So 168 points in Cardiff, you'll do this in the lab, randomly throw them on the square. This is our point pattern. Now again, we take each point, nearest neighbor, distance, put them in the hopper, and compute the cumulative distribution function. These blue ones, are three cases, so three different randomly generated uh, Cardiff points. For each of these, we get our cumulative distribution. So you get a sense of the randomness in this process. You see, they kind of track the theoretical function, but some track them more than others. And so how do we now get an envelope from this? We take a given distance, say two, we go up. We take this as the minimum, we take that as the maximum, and then we do this for every distance and put those together, and that gives us the envelope. The lower is the blue one, the upper is the green one. So you see how these two track our theoretical cumulative distribution function. But it's not even smooth. Why not? Because it depends on how many of these replications you do. The more you do, the smoother it's going to get. Right? And you can do this exact actually takes the minimum and the maximum. You can do similar things with uh, quantiles. So now we're in business. Because now we can state that the black one, which is the observed one, 
is for most of the range of distances, basically beyond one, whatever one is, is outside the envelope that we get from our randomly distributed point patterns where we replicate spatial randomness. So this gives us a basis to reject the null. I'm not going to belabor it too much because, I mean, there is in fact a way to turn this into a specific test statistic. But I'm not going to uh, belabor it, as I said, because it really should be used in an exploratory fashion. So this, you can do this very quickly for a point pattern, and it tells you whether or not it's clustered or regular. Okay, it's about the whole pattern. And just to give you some examples of, well, first of all, above, this is what we've seen so far, is clustering. Below is the opposite, is regular. So the reference is the randomness. This, this is the random spread that we get around our theoretical curve. If the observed one is above the envelope, we reject a null in favor of clustering. If it's below here, below the envelope, we would reject in favor of regular or inhibition. So with that knowledge, now we can play. And as I said, I had a lot of fun. We now know how to do this. We can create a random pattern. And for this random pattern, I computed. This is not one of the randomly, I mean, it is randomly generated, but it's, we take it as being the real pattern. Right? So for this pattern, we get the black curve, which actually amazingly tracks the uh, theoretical one. This is pure luck, OK? Because you see. The envelopes are quite a bit further from the theoretical one. So give, with this pattern, the number of points in this pattern, I generated whatever it was, 99 other ones, drew, I mean, I didn't draw this, the program did it, record what the minimum and maximum is at each of these distances, and that creates the envelope. So here, the observed estimated G function is within the envelopes. Therefore, we cannot reject the null of spatial randomness. Okay. Then I go in my bag of tricks, and I simulate a Poisson cluster process, the one with the parents and the offspring. And this is what I get. Now, it can't get more cluster than that. And it did not, I mean, it didn't work right off the bat. I had to do some trial and error to get the right uh, parameters, because a lot of these so-called clustered patterns are not significantly clustered. And the lab, which we'll do uh, on, on Thursday, will show you some examples of it. But anyway, this one worked sort of. And then you see here, it stays inside the envelope. But then once we, re we exceed this distance, a little less than 0.04, we are clearly outside the envelope. So at those distances, there is clearly evidence of clustering of the pattern. And then the third one is a regular pattern. This was even harder to do, to, to get it right, I mean. Uh, a matern process, this is where, remember, we use the, the disk to kick out the neighbors that are within a given distance to get to simulate the inhibition in the process. And here you see the estimated, the black one, is below the envelope, at least in this part of the, uh, of the distance. And then once we go beyond this distance, it's again inside the envelope. Okay, this is the kind of thing you see in practice. That's why it's exploratory. It's really kind of pushing the limits of inference to tie this to a statistical test and base formal inference on this. OK, let me just use a few more minutes and do the F-test, because the F-test is the same idea, but applied not to event-to-event -event distances, but point-to-event distances. So what's the difference? The difference is we have a reference grid that we put over the points. And each of the lattice points on the grid becomes a quote-unquote point. And that for that lattice point, we find the nearest event, 
and we take the distance from the reference point to the event that goes in the hopper. And we do this for every one of our reference points. So if we have m reference points, we compute the fraction of the m, not n. It has nothing to do with the number of events. The proportions have nothing to do with the number of events, but they're related to the number of reference points that we take, the m. But the principle is the same. We compute, we construct, we estimate a cumulative distribution function of these distances, and then we try to relate that to what it would be under complete spatial randomness. And um, again, we plot the estimated function, an f function, against the distance. This is often called the empty space function in the more uh, recent literature. Uh, originally, it was called point to nearest event distance. So the difference between the two, G function purely deals with events, event to event distances. It's a fraction of n events. Here, the distances are from the reference points to the events, and they're n reference points. It's a fraction of the m reference points. But otherwise, um, it's the same. You uh, find out under complete spatial randomness, it takes a little bit of math, but it's the same idea. You end up with obviously the same cumulative distribution function because it's about not having any points in a circle with a given radius, this time circled around a, a control point, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that we have a way of finding out the probability of finding no points at all in a given area. And that this area happens to be a circle is just a, a, a happenstance that we exploit. But what we really have is the Poisson distribution for number of points in an area. And we do exactly the same thing. We have the envelope. There's two um, decision rules. They're the opposite of the G function. So with the G function, if you're above, it's clustering. If you're below, it's regular. Here, it's the other way around. If you're below, it's clustering. If you're above, it's regular. But you see these look very similar. Okay, now let me ask you a trick question. Why is it that these look so much smoother than the G function? give you a hint. It's between n and n. More points. The control points are under your control. And so if you have if you have event to event distances, you only have as many distances as you have events. So if you have 168 events, you have 168 nearest event distances. If you have 168 events, and you want to put 100,000 control points on there, you'll have 100,000 near point to event distances, and you get much smoother curves. So here we have the black line is the observed, which is below the, I didn't go through the whole uh, exercise again, but the red one is a theoretical one, the green, is the upper envelope, the blue is the lower envelope. The black line is below, pretty much throughout the whole range of distances, below the envelope, which points to clustering. Okay. And to end, let me just show you the three theoretical patterns, I mean theoretical that I simulate. This is complete spatial randomness, and again, I'm very lucky, this tracks the red line almost completely. So this is a random pattern that I generate, and I compute this f function, which is the black line, which tracks the red line almost exactly. But it ha doesn't have to be that way, because you see there is quite a wedge here with these um, envelopes. That clustered patterns, the same ones. You see we start inside the envelope, and then we get out at the higher distances, again suggesting clustering. and for the inhibited, inhibited, 
Matern, the Matern inhibition process, uh, we really, we don't get it with the F statistic. So with the F statistic and this uh, F curve in this particular case, we don't get out of the randomization envelope. In other words, even though this is using a simulation that simulates processes with inhibition, strictly speaking, we cannot reject a null hypothesis that this is spatially random, which goes to show you how difficult it is to assess that. And there's a third function which I'll talk about on Thursday, which is the J function, which is combines the G and the F function. But it's the same idea. Again, we'll re compare it to spatial randomness. Again, we'll get the envelopes and we'll see where the functions are relative to the envelopes. So that's where I'm going to end it for today. Are there any questions?